I work in the North Inner City Folklore Project as a researcher. So I've been researching oral history in the North Inner City since around 1989. Where were you born, Billy? I was born in the building of Satan in the, uh, 1925. I was born on the tour bank near number 87B. We had one room there. And uh, it wouldn't swing a cotton. From what I can remember, everyone's door was always left open, which was great. You could, it was safe enough then, not the way things are now. You could walk out and leave your door wide open. And neighbours shared with each other. If one hadn't got it, the other gave it. And, and that way, nobody was kind of ever short as such. My first memory was uh, playing out in the street in the diamond. Any time I went near the road, the big road that time, the Sean McDermott Street, you know, that the Dolly sisters would shout out the window and tell me, don't go out there, you know. It was very much a sense of being watched over by other people. The Inner City Folklore Project it was set up to collect people's reminiscence of the North Inner City, which, which take in life in the tenements that were around in this area, in the likes of Corporation Buildings, Foley Street, Garner Street, Summer Hill. Sean McDermott Street, all around the north in the city. And I've taken a lot of people's stories of what life was like living inside these tenements. The first book we done was, was Memories, which was all about life in around corporation buildings. That was so popular that we had to go out and do another one, which was called Those Were The Days. And it really took off from them books. That we moved up into Sean McDermott Street and we produced a book called All Around The Diamonds. And then from that, there was another book, Down by the Dockside, which was reminiscent of, of life in, in Sheriff Street and stories on the Docklands. From that then, we went on to do Larius, which was about the school in, of St. Lardin's O'Toole's in Civil Place. These books would have been developed from my uh, earlier days of working in the Lures Day Care Centre when I used to do the meals on wheels. I found out going to these elderly when I was delivering the meals that they always had a story to tell. And I found that it was no, nobody was really, really recording what was happening, like in the way of oral history, what was happening to these people, the changes that they were going through. And I, I felt it was a neglected part of the inner city. Now the Folklore Project, which had been set up in the late 80s, had kind of uh, stopped publications that was revamped, and it gave me a great opportunity to get these people's stories across. I was born in Corporation Buildings. It was knocked down in 1972, and a lot of the people that was here were scattered out to the different housing estates around Dublin. My own mother was moved around into Foley Street. And Foley Street was knocked down also in the late 80s. And the rest of the people again were scattered out of the area. The ideas I get for putting the books together come from previous interviews I do with the people around Dublin, where a lot of these people had moved when, when the, the demolition of the inner city took place. So what I do, I go in search of these people. And this is how I get some of the, the ideas for the books. As I said before, as I, was, as, as I wakes, there was always plenty of drinks going, you know? Mm. And I had bottles of stout and all that kind of And they used to look up and see so and so and they'd go to the wake. Mm. You know, i get a few drinks, you know? When you think back on what you lived in, it's hard to believe. Eight and nine people in the one room, you had to go and get a bale of straw. And your mother would make a sort of a, a big pally ass, we called it. And if we bail a straw for six months, so I get maybe get two of them. And she'd put the straw into the belly and stitch it, put it on the floor. That was your bed. Was there much pollen in them days, was there? Ah, there was pollen. You lived in the pond. You actually lived in the pond. You used to make up a bundle. Your mother would make up a bundle to save a Monday morning. And maybe your father's trousers, you. maybe your, your sister's dress or something, put them all into a bundle. You brought them down to Jack Rafter in the Grand Street there. He might give you half a crown or three shillings or four shillings for it, you know? Maybe you might pawn your father's shoes. You pawn the shoes one Monday, or maybe your suit one Monday. But you got it back out again on the weekend, Friday night. I went back in again the following Monday. That was going on and off all the time, you know? Mm. But the pawns were handy. People would be lost only for them. And that was the way, Terry. Mm. Well, you've been doing the cabaret, you've done the cabaret scene for a while too, didn't you? I did. I've done a lot of charity shows as well. Mm. I sang Raband. We cut a record. Flop for us. A hit for Joe Cuddy six months later. <laughs> he had the money to back and we hadn't. I hope that doesn't go on. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love you to want me was the name of it. And there was me granny and there was my sister Chrissy. She was a great woman and everyone knew her in the buildings as Maggie Hickey. 
and any old knockabouts or anything that was going around, she'd always feed him. Tell me about the time she was sick in bed, and the television. Oh, yeah, she had um, arthritis. And at that time, it was a big thing for anyone to have a television. It was a slot television. You had to put two shillings in it for it to work. And always on a Friday night, we used to love to have her bath and sit down and watch Thriller. What's his name? used to be in it, Boris Karloff. Not what he used to put his mouth to one side, you go, as sure as my name is Boris Karloff, this is a thriller. We lived up for it, you know? We'd be sitting on the rung of the table, waiting on it to start. And we'd be dug into it. And always before it finished, we never got to see the end, the two shillings ago. And we got fed up for it. We'd say, ah, mother, for God's sake, we never see the end of that. She got fed up listening to us. So one time, she cut a piece of lino and tied a string to it. And every time the two shillings would go, a bit of lino would go in. And we'd only have to wait a second or so. And we'd always get to see the end of it then. But in saying that, every time the man came to empty the box, there was no money in it to collect. <laughs> so eventually the telly was taken back. <laughs> would you move back in if it was built up again? If there was a front and back yard, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened is, she used to, the missus, a lovely woman, she used to send a crowd of them over to us to be fed, because yeah. there was only eight of us. Well, yeah. at that time there was even less, there was yeah. five or four. And uh, the ma would make a, get the pan and put yeah. bread and dripping on, you yeah. know? And she would feed them, yeah. because the woman herself couldn't. You yeah, know? She couldn't just talk, couldn't. Yeah. My mother would have to send us to other relations to be fed when my dad was out of work. He worked on the docks and very often, for whatever reason, he wasn't able to get work and uh, we'd go without food. The funny thing about it was it didn't seem like anything because everyone else was in the same boat. But that's my memory. It was poverty. And when you tell that to people that's back in the 50s or 60s, they say, I wasn't that poor. It was. It was every bit that poor. Families were very large and very crowded. The, the overcrowding was, was intense. So many of the mothers, I think, died young or just got wore out, you know. My mother died fairly young. She was barely 40. And I think it was just the sheer stress of feeding and clothing people, you know, just trying to keep kids fed, keep them tidy and trying to get them to school, trying to keep them safe as well, you know, off the streets or whatever. That's my memory of it, that life was shorter. Generations carry on what they learn from each other. If we forget what it's like here, then it's like to say it's not important that people's lives and all those thousands of lives meant nothing. And they do, they're very important. People who lived here were the people who built this city. People still remember each other. They still talk to each other. They still know each other after all these years. People tried in their own way to take care of each other and sometimes succeeded, very often failed. There's a lot of talented people living in the inner city who have great talent, who only need to be given the chance, who only need to be given the facilities to improve their, their work. But they don't get it. They don't get the, the, the facilities for that type of thing down here, regardless of the arts, is non-existent. You know, it's like it's like ourselves when we're trying to get things together, books together. We're going around cap in hand, begging to get sponsorship. You know, that's only for the generosity of local business people that come along and help us. It's it's only for them we would be lost. You know, like people like the Dublin Inner City Partnership. Like the, 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 like the inner city trust do come along and do help out, but we can't keep going back to these people all the time. We need the government to really come along and fund us, give us some proper funding, so we can continue with gathering the oral history of the North Inner City.